Well, this Oregon roster is good enough to win the Pac-12, to get to the college football playoff, and I think to compete at least for a national championship. But it looks like it's set beyond 2023 as well. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, please and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Before we get to individual standouts from Saturday, the context with which I preface that breakdown is I see a lot of future talent on this Ducks roster that thankfully we've gotten to see throughout the course of games that Oregon has won big. That makes me feel really good about this Oregon roster going forward. I'm not just talking about the returners that'll be back next year. Right. And you can go down the roster and look at guys like a Jordan James or maybe a Patrick Herbert comes back. We'll see what T Ferg decides to do. Tez Johnson, a lot of names. You can go both sides of the ball. Jeffrey Bassa as well. I think Justin Jacobs could have another year. There are a lot of names that you can look at and go, boy, I'd love to have them back next year too. But on Saturday, we saw a glimpse of what the true depth of this roster is. And I think it's superb. I think it's superb, and I think this team is built to compete right here and now. And I don't feel that if Oregon doesn't get to the playoff this year, that they won't have another chance to do so three, four, five years down the line. I I think that cupboard is really well stocked. And we don't even know, by the way, what true freshmen are going to pop next year, what players who redshirted this year will pop next year as redshirt freshmen, but their first season of you know really playing college football. Look at a lot of defensive linemen, linebacker Jerry Mixon, Jerry on Dickey at wide receiver, Kyler Casper could pop. I mean, just a lot of names out there. But you also don't know what's going to happen in the transfer portal class. And I think that talent acquisition is such a huge part of college football, as we all know. Dan Lanning and his staff, I mean, they, they, they get it. They get an A. They, they, they get an A. This, this roster, I think, is absolutely loaded. And it's just when you look at every position group, I see at least one big time playmaker, right? Off the top of my head, safety, Evan Williams flies all over the place. Linebacker, Jeff Bossa, great blitzer and a fantastic quarterback spy. Defensive line, pick your choice. I'll go with Brandon Dorless, but Jordan Birch looks awesome. Offensive line, JPJ should be an All American. Tight end, Herbert and Tiford, both studs. Troy Franklin, a receiver. Bucky Irving, a running back. Like this roster. And then you look at what's, what's you know, kind of next. And I'm I'm a big time live in the moment sort of guy because Oregon's got a great opportunity right here and now. But I simultaneously am excited and focused on what opportunity is presented to the Ducks, which is play for the Pac-12 championship and the right to be in the college football playoff. I'm also excited thinking about the future because I think that there are a lot of playmakers out there. So let's get to some of them here because our individual standouts from Saturday's game. Well, I guess mine. Let me know in the comment section or on Twitter, subtext, wherever, who you thought stood out. Who deserves a big shout-out here? Let's start with Brandon Dorless. This guy is such a beast. He was Oregon's best defensive lineman last year. He's our best defensive lineman this year, and he's an even better player than he was last year. I get questions here on the show routinely about, hey, how do you feel about you know the balance between recruiting and developing, getting the most out of guys? The University of Oregon has gotten the most out of Brandon Dorless. This is a... Mario Cristobal recruit from, I think, the 2018 or 19 class. He was not a super highly sought after three-star guy, didn't play a ton early in his career, and has developed into a future, I would guess, probably third or fourth round draft pick. He is real good, and he's just such a big part of what this team does defensively and why they're so good, which I'll talk about later in the show as well. And I think that the added talent Guys like Jordan Birch, Mateo Uyunglele, you know, Casey Rogers and Sam Taimani playing well. I think those guys are, as we talked about over the summer, having an impact on Brandon Dorless in that 
having to focus on them frees up Dorless to make more plays. And I think he's been fantastic. And he was everywhere on Saturday. He stood out to me in a big way. So too did Jordan Birch. But when I talk about the future, a couple guys here. Well, before, before I get to the future one, let, let's shout out Dante Manning because he has not in his Oregon career hit his full potential given his athletic gifts. He has struggled in, in the pass defense department, not staying glued to wide receivers, but having the ball skills and the wherewithal to get your head around. Three pass breakups in the game for Dante Manning. That's really encouraging. And that is Oregon's, what, number maybe five corner? Number four? Number five corner here? I mean, you'd probably go Kyrie Jackson, Jaleel Florence, Nico Reed, probably Triquest Bridges, and then Dante Manning. Yeah, he's probably the number five cornerback out there. So he had an awesome game. But how about Cole Martin? The, I, I, I'm i I'm so in on that guy. Remember our first impression of Cole Martin? Let's Joker style in 2008's movie, or 2008's The Dark Knight. Let's wind the clocks back to the spring game. Not a year, but just to the spring game. Chris Hudson, the reigning number two receiver for the Ducks, statistically from the 2022 campaign, is going up mano a mano with this true freshman Cole Martin, who was one of the first commits of the 2023 class. He's the son of Oregon's defensive backs coach, Demetrius Martin. So you go, well, you know, he's going to have a high football IQ. And we'll see if it's one of those instances where I just want to play for dad or I'm actually a really good player. That dude, that's going to be a player right there. That guy, he had an interception, pass breakup, couple tackles. Yeah, I'm in on that guy because our first impression was, wow, he's just coming out of the gates as a true freshman, just shutting down Chris Hudson, who's already played two successful years. Or no, it would have been three successful years of college football. He's just he's just glued to him. He's almost getting an interception. Well, he showed you that that guy's going to be ready. That guy's 100% going to be ready. So that was a big standout for me. How about on that tight end screen? I'll get to Patrick Herbert in a moment. How about Jackson Powers Johnson and Steven Jones? Jeff Schwartz, who continues to be one of my favorite followers on Twitter, was shouting. He always shouts out the big fellas, which I do too. One of my good friends uh, was an offensive lineman back in, in high school. So I always have an affinity. You know, I had uh, other friends that were non offensive linemen, but he's certainly my closest friend that was on my high school football team. And he was an offensive lineman, he was a center. And so I always have an affinity for the big guys when they're playing well and try to give them the love they deserve. JPJ is so awesome. But on that tight end screen to Patrick Herber that went for a touchdown, those two guys got 50 yards down the field and were making blocks. And I tell you what, you got to be some kind of athlete and you got to have some kind of drive. I saw this great tweet about it that if you see these two coming at you, DBs are about to make a business decision. Yeah, I'd, I'd make a business decision. JPJ is a big dude. Steven Jones is a mammoth of a human being. I mean, he is a big, bulky, strong, powerful guy. And I tell you what, those two getting all the way down the field to clear the lane on that touchdown, great call from Will Stein. He's introduced the tight end screen over the last couple of weeks. I love it. I love it. We've got the weapons to, to utilize them. And I think they've been brilliantly called. Uh, speaking of Patrick Herbert, two touchdowns for, for Justin's younger brother. Free Herbert, by the way. Get Staley out of there, please. But Patrick Herbert just shows up and does whatever is asked of him. He he. This is the best he has looked in his Oregon career. He's battled injuries. He looks fully healthy. I mean, he he you know he had the big time touchdown in the Washington game. He makes great blocks. He's good in pass protection. I love everything about him. I, I think it is utterly fantastic that a guy who has stuck it out amidst injuries and going up and down the depth chart, he he has solidified himself as the number two tight end. And boy, he is a damn good one. He is he is a really good number two tight end. Casey Kelly had a touchdown as well, the number three tight end for the Ducks. Who did he catch it from? He caught it from the last individual standout that we got to talk about from Saturday. LinkedIn jobs is a standout. You know why? Because these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. And you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. What a great combination that is like Bo Nix and Patrick Herbert. Mm, real good. 
Go in there and create a free job post in minutes. Really easy. Add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one. That's numero uno in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Feeling so much better on today's show. Being sick is the worst. We are less sick. I'd say about 85%, which is all anyone on the Oregon team could really ask for because it's football. It's a physical game. Oregon, thankfully, knock on wood, has got a lot of health going into this Oregon State matchup. But back to Saturday for a moment. Yes, I know Ty Thompson threw an interception that wasn't exactly ideal and gave us shades of... The not ready tie, the undeveloped tie, the raw, the not processing things very well, the lock on to a receiver tie. Did you see the touchdown that he threw to Casey Kelly? If you didn't, let me give you my best recalling from memory play by play description. It's a fake toss, double post wheel concept, very commonly used in college football. Great to run to the boundary side of the field because it takes a corner and a safety and puts them in conflict because two guys run at him and then go over the field. And then a third guy, Casey Kelly, often a tight end, given the formation, wheels up the sideline where there is now a void. Now, Arizona State actually defends the play incredibly well. Casey Kelly is available, but he is not by any means wide open. Ty Thompson, after faking the toss, reads the defense, sees the corner and safety in the middle and uh, left third of the field, from defense's perspective anyway, right third for the offense, drop off enough with the receivers as the play is designed to do. He knows that Casey Kelly's his target. He looks and he sees the linebacker underneath in what I believe was zone coverage. He's not in a horrible spot, but then the corner who has that deep third responsibility, realizes, "Uh uh-oh, this is double post wheel. He's going to go to the tight end. So he starts making a break for it. And Thompson, using his mega howitzer of an arm, puts the ball right on his hands, kind of like Justin Herbert did to Quentin Johnston. The difference is Casey Kelly caught it, took a little hit, dropped the ball after he crossed the pylon. No Cameron Colvin incident touchdown ducks everything with ty thompson i'm not saying it'd be perfect if he was oregon starting quarterback in 2024 that is a special throw that is that is an absolute seed of a dart of a laser whatever you want to describe it as that's a special throw from ty thompson and one that We have seen him, I go back to the Cal game, for instance, he made a couple of awesome throws. Rolling to his right, hitting, I think it was Treshawn Holden on the over route, third and two, deep cross to Gary Bryant, third and goal, the fade to Treshawn Holden. He has made several, I could could give you half a dozen more throws that he's made this year that I don't think he makes in previous years. I think that Will Stein is excellent. He's the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. I think Bo Nix is awesome, and we know he's a very cerebral guy. He's a very big leader on this Oregon team. I think that Bo Nix being there in front of Ty for the last couple of years has been great for him. I think making those throws is really encouraging. And no, I don't think he's a perfectly finished product. We saw that on the interception, but I watched that touchdown throw and went, man, that's kind of what we've been looking for. That, that, that's why he's the highest rated quarterback recruit in Oregon history. It's just, it's another piece of information. We're going to have the whole off season to talk about this stuff. So I'm going to table this debate until after the year, but I'm just saying all this stuff, you, you got to factor it in. If you look at the interception and go, oh man, same old tie. You have to look at these sorts of throws and go, okay, not the same old tie. You got to, you got to calculate it evenly. So. Those are my individual standouts. Brandon Dorless, Cole Martin, Dante Manning, JPJ, Stephen Jones, Patrick Herbert, Ty Thompson. Let me know who stood out to you in the YouTube comments or on Twitter. If you think they deserve a shout out here on the show, you could also become a Locked on Ducks insider at subtext. 
Join the link in the description below wherever you're listening to or watching this show. Free 14-day trial, then just $5 a month. You get all sorts of breaking news, reaction, analysis, talk with me one-on-one, and get priority mail back. So the game formerly and now seemingly returning to being known as the Civil War uh, is going to be played this Friday in Eugene. And there has been discussion going on behind the scenes, according to John Canzano, about continuing the series. Now, the Apple Cup, which is Washington and Washington State, they're extending that series through 2028. I think that's great. And I really hope that happens with the Civil War. Now, they'd have to either buy out Boise State of their series completely or give them a little bit of money to help with costs of finding a new game and postpone the matchup to the 2030s. College football scheduling is ridiculous and dumb and whatnot. But anyway, this is the way that it's done. The game would be played at a different point in the season. But to me, that's still better than nothing. I'm an old school kind of guy. I have a lot of friends that are Oregon State fans. I grew up going to and watching this game. I don't want to see it go away. I don't. I know there are some Oregon State fans that don't want anything to do with Oregon. There are Washington State fans that want nothing to do with Washington. There are Oregon and Washington fans who don't want to play their their, their little brother rivals anymore. I'm not one of those people. Not not a part of it. Do not put me in that conversation or in that group of people. I want to see it continue. I like regionality. I like tradition. I like history. Call me a sucker. So the game would be played at a different point in the season. I think the date for next year would be September 14th. It would have a different feel, but it'd still be better than nothing. Just my two cents. Now, some Oregon fans would say, well, you know, what's the benefit? You know, beating them doesn't get you anything and losing is, is, is a big hit. That's true. And I understand that. Here's where I come at it, though. If Oregon State is now going to be seen unfairly as a group of five team, which I I, I don't fully accept that as a given, by the way, what Washington State and Oregon State are essentially going to be, if what I think is the most likely scenario comes to fruition here, they'll essentially be independents. Okay, so think of playing BYU before they joined the Big 12. There were years in which BYU is a top 15, 20 team. There were years where BYU is... eh, playing a decent schedule and they're going six and six, seven and five, like they did last year. They were an eight and five football team after they won their bowl game. I think that when you're going to the 12 team college football playoff era, having a quality G five or independent non-conference win, whatever you want to call it. I'm not saying it makes all the difference in the world. It can certainly help you though. If Jonathan Smith stays at Oregon state and they're able to put together a competitive schedule that allows them to be a top 25 team, They can do that if they're playing a heavy Mountain West schedule, but they have enough power five opponents to get respect from the college football world, which they absolutely deserve, as we have seen over the last couple of seasons where they've been a household name inside the top 25. Then, yeah, then it's just another quality. It'd be if Oregon wins a quality win for the Ducks. There is upside. I'm not saying it's unlimited, but I do think there's upside for Oregon. Because I think Jonathan State or Jonathan Smith is a really good coach for Oregon State. So I think having a win like that can help the Ducks. And most importantly, like beyond that, the reason that I want it to continue and for this to not be the last scheduled edition of the Civil War on Friday is because of the rivalry and the tradition and the regionality. And we're losing that in college football. And any semblance of that that we can grasp onto, I'm I'm supportive of. In terms of the format, you know, I would love if the Big Ten could let it be later in the year, like Florida State and, and Florida, for instance. So that's one school that I'm okay with playing an eight-game conference slate. That's Florida State, because one of their non-conference opponents every year is Florida. And there are a couple other schools like that, right? Clemson and South Carolina play every year because it's a regional rivalry. They're in the same state, but they're in different conferences. So there's precedent there. It might move around a little bit. It might not feel exactly the same, so I don't love it, right? I associate Thanksgiving with the Civil War because they're always around the same time. So I don't think it would be perfect, but it would certainly be better than nothing to have the game and have it played in weeks that we're not accustomed to than to not play the game at all. Just my two cents, but again, curious what you fans uh, are all thinking about out there. We have some mailbag questions to answer, including how, how good is Oregon's defense like really how how really good 
is Oregon's defense. Hmm. I don't know. How really good are you at making picks over on Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America? The answer is you won't know until you give it a try. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and you watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy. So your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So you don't have to deal with that maddening frustration like you do when you're playing fantasy football, for instance. That's just one of many great things about Prize Picks. So go get started today at prizepicks.com slash college. Use that code Locked On College for a first deposit match up to $100. prizepicks.com slash college and use code Locked On College for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, let's hop into the mailbag here. YouTube comments or Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at Locked On Ducks are the handles over there. If you want priority mailbag access, Join the Locked On Ducks subtext community. I appreciate the people who support the show over there. This question came from the subtext community, which is why it goes to the top of the mailbag. That's how it works, as promised. CJ Verdell hasn't done much in the NFL, but this question was uh, regarding Bucky Irving's fate in the NFL. I think it's pretty clear Irving will be done at Oregon after this year. He's put together back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons. He's really good. I don't think he's a second or third round NFL pick. I I, I think he gets drafted for sure. Here's the thing I wonder about with him. He is such an outstanding college back with a unique identifiable style. I think he actually has to get some of his tendencies coached out of him. What do I mean by that? When Bucky Irving runs, he is not content just picking up two or three yards. He wants to hit a home run every time he touches the ball. And at the collegiate level, it works really well. Every now and then, he'll take a big loss trying to do too much, and that happens. But in the NFL, if you try too hard to not take what is already there, you're going to run into problems. And I think that Bucky Irving, I don't know that he's a number one back in the NFL. I think he can certainly be a rotational guy. We know he can catch passes. We know he, you know, has had issues in the past in pass protection. He has to get better at that to be sure. I think when he just puts his foot in the ground and makes lateral cuts, that's when he is really at his best. You know, like the Washington State game. That's the sort of stuff, you know, he's got great vision, exceptional balance, really strong, good speed, great lateral movement and a great ability to make you miss. He's just a hard guy to tackle. He is not the most agile. He doesn't have the quick feet like LaMichael James. He's got good home run speed. I don't think it's great like a DeAnthony Thomas or even a Thomas Tyner perhaps, but I think that there's a place for him in the NFL. I don't think it's as a number one back, and I think that what he's going to learn when he gets there is when you run downhill, You have to be willing sometimes to just take what's there because if you try and do too much on every single play, I think in the NFL, that'll come back to bite you. But when he's able to find a crease, he's going to make guys miss. He's hard to tackle. He's a really, really dynamic player. I think he's probably a mid-round pick, and he's a rotational back on any team in the league. Absolutely. I think of him as like – I don't know if you all remember this name, but Washington's Savon Ahmed, who's still playing on the Miami Dolphins, I think he can be that sort of guy. Like, Ahmed's been in the league for, you know, half a dozen years now, I, I think, or somewhere around that time. He's been there. I think he was last on Washington in 2019. He's been on the Dolphins for the last several seasons across a couple coaching staffs, and he's not the number one back, but he's featured in the offense every single week because he's just a good runner. And I think Bucky Irving is better than Ahmed. So I think that Bucky Irving can have that kind of role, but I do think stylistically he has to learn to, you know, be a little bit more of a one cut guy sometimes because you're not going to be able to so easily, you know, dance away and stay on your feet when you're playing in the NFL. 
Let's get to a couple questions here from Blazer Duck to wrap up today's show. He is an everydayer out there and a regular question asker here on the pod. Spencer, for years now, Utah has been known for having the best defense in the Pac-12. I think it's time for the narrative to change to the Ducks having the best defense. They're the most physically dominant team. Your thoughts? Well, if you look at the numbers, UCLA actually has the best defense in the pack this year, and they're nasty. They're, they're, they're nasty. De'Anthony Lynn, I think, is the name of their defensive coordinator. He's up for the Broyles Award this year. You know why? Because he's really sharp. That's a great hire by Chip Kelly, who I think has saved his job for the moment, as he should have, after he went in and thumped USC in their home stadium 38-20. to 20. So Oregon's tied with UCLA for the lowest points per game allowed in the pack this year at 16.7. That's very, very good. They're second in yards per game allowed to UCLA. And their top three, the Ducks are in both passing yards allowed, their first, and rushing yards allowed, their third. UCLA, again, one of the teams that's ahead of them. So I think when you like th th this conversation almost feels moot because I think you're kind of asking like a big cultural question about, you know, what's the best defensive unit or culture in the entire conference, but the conference is going away. You know, if you look at what exists in the Big Ten, you got some great defenses there, right? Iowa's got a great defense. Ohio State has suddenly built a really good defense. Michigan plays really good defense. Penn State plays very good defense. They don't have a lot of offenses over there. They don't score any points. You know, Nebraska's got a good defense. They can't score. Minnesota defends. They can't score. Iowa I, I think Iowa's playing Nebraska this week, and the over-under is like 26 and a half. That's hysterical. That is absolutely hysterical. The Big Ten West as a whole is hysterical. But that, again, will be more of an off-season topic. Uh, I think this year you certainly have to put Oregon's defense up there as one of the best in the Pac-12. Statistically, you'd give the edge to UCLA, but it's a pretty marginal it's a pretty marginal difference there. I, I, I think Oregon's defense, here's the only thing that we need to care about. Oregon's defense is good enough to win the Pac-12 and to go to the college football playoff and compete for a national championship. I fully believe that. I fully believe that. And, and I think you can you know, put on your lawyer suits and your lawyer hat and put on a, a show to make an argument for either defense being better than the other. You know, Oregon played a power five non-conference opponent on the road. UCLA did not because Michigan bailed on them. So, you know, that's certainly helping their numbers a little bit to have an extra game against an inferior opponent. They played North Carolina Central, whereas the Ducks played Texas Tech, who's a bowl team. So, yeah, I I, I think that's, you know, kind of iffy there. But I mean, Oregon, UCLA, Utah, Oregon State, those are the best defenses of the Pac-12 this year. And, and I think Oregon, UCLA, and Utah are a step above the Beefs, who have a good defense, as uh, we'll talk about throughout the week. Lastly here, and this is an important one. This is a very important thing to know going into rivalry week in college football. Spencer, with the results last Saturday and rivalry weekend this week, what should we as Duck fans be hoping for results-wise? Great question. I love that we're into this time of year. We're going to blink. The season will be over. Hopefully, it'll be great. And then the offseason will be here, and we'll be counting down the days till we've got football again. So I'm enjoying it while we've got it. Uh, first thing that Oregon should want is Ohio State to beat Michigan. I don't think the Ducks will have a problem as a conference champion getting in over a non-conference champion, one loss, Ohio State or Michigan team. I just like to be sure of things, and Ohio State has a much stronger resume. So if they lost to Michigan, their resume is more dangerous than Michigan's. So Ohio State to beat Michigan would be ideal. I also just think as a general principle, I root against teams that schedule a cupcake of a non-conference slate. Not a fan. If you schedule a power five team and they end up not being very good, like Washington scheduled Michigan State in a home and home, for instance, they should be rewarded for that. Michigan State ended up not being good this year. They were supposed to be good last year. Washington beat them. They weren't supposed to be good this year. And Washington beat them by by a lot of points. So that that should be treated differently than Michigan canceling a home and home with UCLA. OK, I hate that more than anything. So Ohio State to beat Michigan. Auburn to beat Bama in the Iron Bowl, which, you know, good luck. Auburn got housed by New Mexico State. 
I, I can't believe that happened, but it did. Uh, I'm just going to talk about rivalry week right now. Florida beating Florida State would knock the Seminoles out with Jordan Travis out for the season, which I think sucks. It's the reality, though. They're not going to be the same team. Florida, if they at least play Florida State tight, that helps. If they beat Florida, or if they beat Florida State, rather, if Florida wins, that'd be even better. Because that's a team that is currently, this is before the college football playoff rankings come out that I'm recording this show on Monday night. I suspect Florida State will remain, despite their impressive win against North Alabama. Vomit. They trailed 13 to nothing, by the way. If Florida is at least able to play them tight, maybe Oregon could leapfrog them. If, but it, it, like, it'd still be tough. It, it would still be tough. Oregon sh- should also want Texas to beat Texas Tech. Now, if Texas Tech beats Texas, sure, that strengthens the Texas Tech win by a sizable amount. By the way, Tyler Shuck is in the transfer portal. Just thought I would share. Unfortunately, he underwent injuries this year uh, or had injuries this year, which sucks. And they were a much better team with him. But um, I continue to think that we want Texas to serve as a buffer between us and Alabama. I don't want to get into a resume debate with Alabama because Bama has a stronger resume. Full stop. Oregon's got a better loss. Sure. Bama's got several wins that the committee will look at as stronger. And finally, if Georgia Tech wants to beat Georgia, well, that would ensure the SEC only gets one team in, but that's not going to happen. So Ohio State, Auburn, Florida, Texas, Georgia Tech, that's who Oregon fans are rooting for this week in Rivalry Week. Beavs game on Friday. Going to talk about that as the week goes on. Let me know what you want to hear below. Comments, YouTube, Twitter, anywhere, subtext, by all means. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, go Ducks.